Good morning. It's good to see you guys. I'm excited to be here. And uh, I first want to share a little bit about Youth for Christ and what we've been up to. And then I'm going to dive in to the message. You know, it, 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 there's, it's really, there's no secret that um, there's a growing need among young people in our community. Um, I just learned that, that the U.S. Surgeon General just declared youth mental health at a state of emergency in the U.S. I, and I shared before that the CDC just ranked Duluth, Minnesota as ninth leading in depression of any other city in the United States. And you and I both know that, you know, this, this stems from a deep need for identity, purpose, belonging that is only found in Jesus Christ. One statistic shows that one-third of teens report not having a trusted adult in their life. 50% of teens um, aren't even connected to a church in any way. We are at a pivotal moment where we could see a generation, a whole generation, slip through the cracks, and it, it feels like a time where, like a hopeless time. Like, what do we do? But man, you know, we know we have a living hope. And the, the mission of Youth for Christ, this organization that I've now be, become a part of and it's been going really well, um, we have a mission. We are on a mission to reach lost teens, ages 11 to 19 years of age, in and around the schools. And how we do that is we empower young people, teenagers, gather them together to reach their friends in and around the schools through a weekly gathering called Campus Life, where it's simply, what we're doing is creating community in the schools, like little secret churches, where it's not a Bible study, it's student Christians getting together to reach out to their friends and create something during the week that they can invite their lost friends to, where they will experience authentic Christ-sharing relationship and have a ton of fun and go on trips, and learn a bunch of stuff. And, and I've been meeting with the principal at Duluth East and uh, the president of the, the school board here in Duluth, and um, there's an understanding that there's, they, they see that there is a deep need in, in teens, and there's this openness. And, and really, we, we can be in the schools if it's student-led and we have a teacher host. And so there are avenues. And so a lot of people ask, well, how are you going to get in the schools? But there are avenues, and there is an openness before and after. And, and, and so um, that is our hope, and that is how we are going to reach these kids. And our hope, really, at Head of Lakes Youth for Christ, our mission is to reach everybody in the Head of Lakes. And, and that it goes up to Two Harbors. That's Duluth. That's Superior. That's up Northwestern. That's down in Barnum. Like this whole area. And, and really, our goal is to create, first, one sustainable ministry that is actually reaching kids that we can create a hub that will create more sustainable ministries. It's really kind of like church planting in a way. And so we're going to start at Duluth East. Duluth East is the largest school in the Northland, 1,500 students. And we have connections here and with teachers there. And so we're going to start there. And I just ask, would you guys just pray for us? And if you want to know more, I have newsletters in the back that we just made and my card, and you can sign up for our newsletter on our email. And then also, to our Christmas Eve offering here is going to be going towards reaching kids at Duluth East. And, um, and so just we pray that you start saving your pennies to give to the Christmas Eve offering to, to provide that for those kids in reaching lost kids in the schools. And so that's my YFC spiel. And... and, and um, also, too, um, I just want to say thank you. A lot of you guys know, and some of you know that Mary's dad um, passed away uh, this a couple weeks ago. Um, we were done here uh, on October 23rd and then had a Sunday off, and then Mary's dad came down with COVID, and it turned to pneumonia, and, um, and uh, he passed away, and we were able to be there with him, and it was this beautiful time. And then we've been filling in at his, he's a pastor of a church over in Superior, uh, First Covenant Church. Um, over in Superior, and, uh, and so we've been, I've been preaching every Sunday and leading worship, and that's been interesting, but really good. And so <laughs> I thought I'd get, like, more time off, but it was just, like, one Sunday and then into the next things, and so. I did not, did I say I led worship? I led worship. <laughs> it was amazing. I don't, <laughs> I want them to hear it in that way. Yeah. Cool. So, Guys, I just want to say thank you guys for praying. There's been so many people like reaching out, 
praying for us, encouraging us, sending us sympathy cards, and really grateful for that. So thank you. Thank you, thank you. And so that's my update, and um, I get to preach today. And so, but before I get preached, in Colossians chapter 1, 13 through 16, will you guys stand up and say hi to somebody? You could run and grab a cookie real quick or some coffee, get whatever you need, and then we'll dive into this passage. That would be awesome. So make sure, say hi to two people. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, it says this, He, this is God, has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Let me pray. Father, we just want your word to saturate our life. Today's message is an observance of who you are, and I just pray, Lord God, that you would help us to see that you truly are the image of the invisible God. There is none above you, and we just thank you that we serve you and that you love us and that we get to see what God is like through your life. And so we just pray that you'd speak to us in a special way today. Lord, you know what we need. Thank you. Speak to us now. Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. So today we begin our Christmas series, um, and it's entitled, What Child Is This? And um, this is really a time of year where we kind of prepare our minds and answer this question and consider, who is this child that lay in the manger on Christmas morning? And if you answer this correctly, it will completely transform your entire life. I remember when I was a kid, and um, at my grandparents' house, we'd go down there on Christmas Eve, down in Brooklyn Center, and uh, before we were open our presents at night, which we'd do on Christmas Eve, the only toys that they had for me to play with were uh, the nativity scene. And, uh, and so I remember taking the nativity scene down from my grandparents' um, TV stand and playing with them. And at, at, at that point in history, I was way into the WWF, you know, World Wrestling Federation, and um, the wise men were like a tag team, and Mary and Joseph were another tag team, and the, they had to protect baby Jesus. And so that's what I would play. And I remember my grandma like being like, uh, you need to stop. This, there's something wrong with this. And, and she's like, put my stuff back now. And so I'd put it back. And I remember, I distinctly remember looking at this baby and, and, and wondering like, what is the deal with you, baby Jesus? Why does the coolest holiday of the year revolve around a baby. Even at like my young age, before I answered this question for myself, I knew that there was, there was something special about this child. It was obvious. And really, in this season, each year, each one of us must prepare our hearts and ask this same question, what child is this? Just like Jesus would often ask those who would follow his ministry, he would say, who do you say that I am? And to do that, we have chosen the book of Colossians to answer this question in this season. What child is this? Which is a question for the church in Colossians, or the Colossian church, they must get this right. Because Paul hears from his friend who we met last week, Epaphras, who was an early convert of Paul and, and one of the first leaders of this church in Colossae, that while this church is full of faith and hope and love, there is this doctrine, this false doctrine that is creeping into the church. And the question is that, is Jesus really all that you need to be saved? The error that is creeping into this church is, is called syncretism. It, it, which is a combining of other philosophies and other religions like paganism or Judaism, and it combined um, Christian thought and Greek thought, which is today we know as Gnosticism. And, and the Gnostics believed that one must obtain a secret knowledge to be right with God, to be accepted by God. They taught that faith alone and Christ alone wasn't enough for one to be saved. 
There was something else that you needed. And, and there's a key scripture in all of Colossians that kind of show what Paul, the point that Paul is trying to get across and the, the struggles that they're facing in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8 through 9. He says, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human traditions, according to elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Verse 9, For in him the whole Fullness of deity dwells bodily. And where we left off last week was Paul's greeting, and he's encouraging this church in this letter, and he's praying for them. And his prayer is that God would fill them with the knowledge of who Christ is. And we learned why Paul prays this is because if they don't obtain this knowledge, if they don't understand who Christ really is, they will never be able to walk out this Christian faith. Paul knows that without the knowledge of Jesus, they will never be able to bear fruit for God. They'll never be able to develop the strength that they need to live out this faith. And they'll never realize that today they have everything they need. They're already qualified and they already possess an inheritance prepared for them in Christ. Paul wants them to know there's nothing else that you need today to your faith. You don't need to add anything to your faith to obtain, to obtain eternal life. Like some might tell you, you have everything you need. And so let's look at verses 13 through 14. And we're going to look through this section. Paul wants us first to know that this Jesus in the manger, born of a virgin, was in fact God in his rescue plan for the world living in darkness. Verse 13, it says, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. The first thing that Paul wants uh, the early church to know is that because of their faith in Christ, they have been delivered. It says that he, this is God, has delivered us us, them, those who have faith in Christ, from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. The first thing that we see is that we have been delivered. This word delivered simply means you've been rescued. That God saw that you were in a state of darkness and that we needed to be rescued from that darkness and into a new kingdom. The picture of deliverance here is the same picture of the Israelites being in slavery for 400 years under the pharaohs of Egypt. God's people were in a dark state of captivity by something evil, something that controlled them, and they were burdened. And it led them to an early death. The Israelites were born under captivity, and they will die under captivity unless God intervenes and does something. And if you didn't know, before you knew Jesus, you, we, were all in captivity by the domain of darkness and without God's intervention into our world. Like God did for the Israelites, you and I were dead men and dead women walking in the domain of darkness. What's this domain of darkness looks like? We see it in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Take a look at the screen here. It says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of humanity. Here's the domain of darkness that God has rescued each one of us, if you placed your faith in him, from. The domain of darkness looks like walking the course of this world, following the power of Satan, that there is a dark spirit that controlled and caused us to live for the desires of the body and mind. Thinking, we were thinking that 
Being fulfilled in life comes from doing what feels right to us or our desires, right? Isn't that the way of the world? My feelings determine my life. Not realizing that this is simply a death march that leads to more darkness. And then Paul says that those who believe have been transferred from darkness to a new kingdom of his beloved son. Just like if you were to transfer right now $400 into my bank account, from your bank account to mine, it has been transferred. And I'm not going to transfer that back in your bank account. Like, it's not going to happen, right? And I'm just making that observation, that joke, I just I want to point out the words, he has. Meaning that what we are talking about in verses 13 and 14 has already happened to you who believe. That if you have faith in Christ today, you have been rescued and transferred into the kingdom of light. This is something that you possess today. It is yours. If you have answered the question correctly, what child is this, you have been transferred. Sometimes we as Christians can feel like, man, I need God to deliver me from this darkness. Or we might say, God, I need you to deliver me from fill in the blank. But we must always remind ourselves that you are delivered. You have been delivered from any darkness. You have been rescued from any scheme that the enemy can throw your way. You have been delivered, transferred. If you get anything out of this sermon today, I hope that you realize that you have been delivered today. On your drive home, thank the Lord. God, thank you that I am delivered. Not that I'm going to be delivered, but that I am delivered. That no matter the darkness that I sense around me, I am delivered. Just celebrate Celebrate today what you already have in Christ, that you have been transferred from one kingdom of darkness into another kingdom of light, the kingdom of his beloved son, and there ain't no going back. But there's more. There's a couple other things that you have today. Verse 14, Paul gives us two other things that we have. It says we have... In our possession right now, if you've placed your faith in Christ, we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. Redemption means that you have been bought with a price. That God has redeemed you. God has purchased you. We all know nothing in life is free, and neither was delivering you from darkness. And the cost to set you free was the ultimate price that only God could pay. Never you. You don't have the funds and never could. And God values you so much that he was willing to shed his own blood to transfer you into his kingdom to redeem you. As you've been purchased and transferred, what is it that God has purchased and provided for those of us who have placed our faith in this child the forgiveness of sins. The forgiveness of sins. It's hold on, I got a little mixed up here. My okay, three, one, two, turning the page. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, three. Transferred. There we wait. Whoa, hold on. Sorry. All right, hold on. My pages got mixed up. Three transferred. Turning the page. Okay, cool. Got a little mixed up. Should have checked my pages. Oh, there we go. Oh. This is all part of the show, guys. This is all part of the show. Now, should I kick the stand off so Josh knows that I was here? All right, cool. So we've been transferred. We have have the forgiveness of sins, meaning that because God's redeeming work on the cross... He has purchased you, providing forgiveness. 
He's canceled any and all debts that you have today or will ever have. You need to hear that. Any and all debts that you had, have, or will ever have. Again, this is so important for the church in Colossae to understand that they know this because without us seeing the things that we really possess, we will never be able to live into our new identity as sons and daughters of a king in a new kingdom. We have to see ourselves as citizens of a new kingdom, not a kingdom of darkness, a kingdom of light, a kingdom of good and not evil, a kingdom of transferred people who are already placed in heaven with God for all eternity. It's not something that you jump back and forth in and out of. It's, something, it's not something you pay for or have to pay off. You are already possessed, redeemed, and forgiven if you have but believed in Christ today. It's not until we realize who we are in Christ and the inheritance, this inheritance that we already share in, when we actually begin to walk out into a new identity. Who is Jesus? What child is this? He is the ransom for your sins. He's the one who made you able for all to believe, to step out of slavery and into a new kingdom. What child is this? In verse 15, we're going to learn something big. He is the image of the invisible God. Verse 15, Paul says, He, this is Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Paul says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. How cool is that? How amazing is that? Have you thought of that? Have you ever looked at the stars at night and thought, man, I wonder what God is like. He created all this. I wonder what he's really like. Or maybe you're not even at that place of believing in God, but saying, if there is a God, man, I, would, I wonder what he's like. Paul is telling us that if you want to know God's personality, his will, his heart, and his heart for you in the world, then look no further than Jesus, because Jesus is the image of the invisible God. We obviously know that God is spirit, that God is invisible, but we can see him through Christ. That's what Paul says, but that's also what Jesus says in John chapter 14, verse 6. He's talking to Philip, and he says, I am the way, I am the truth, and the life. He says, no one comes to the Father except through me. And then verse 7 if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Verse 9, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. He's the image of the invisible God. The fact that Jesus is the image of the invisible God conveys two things. Number one, Jesus enables us to see what God is really like. And number two, Jesus reveals God's heart to man. And if you want to know God, read the Gospels of Jesus Christ, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Read them. Pray, spend time in prayer to Jesus. Jesus, I want to know you more. I want to know who you really are. What child is this? He's the image of the invisible God. What child is this? Paul next talks about his supremacy. He says that Jesus is the firstborn of all creation. What does that mean? The firstborn of all creation? At first glance, it really, it doesn't really make sense. If, if he's the firstborn of all creation, then when did that happen? If, if, is he talking about his birth when he was born from Mary in the manger? Well, that doesn't add up. He was obviously the firstborn in his household, but there was many born before Jesus. If he was born, well, then that wouldn't make him God. That would make him a demigod. 
What is Paul talking about? Firstborn of all creation. Was Jesus literally a created being by God? And this has actually tripped many people up over the years. The Jehovah Witnesses have, have taken this verse and formed a theology around this phrase. They believe that Jesus was the first created being of Jehovah who was originally Michael the archangel. That's what the Jehovah Witnesses believe. And if they would just read the next verse, and you will see, we can interpret pretty easily that Paul is not saying that Jesus is the firstborn in a literal sense. But this word firstborn is used to designate supremacy. That Jesus reigns supreme over all that has been created. We can see in the Old Testament when this word has, firstborn has been used. Psalm 89 verse 27. In here, Scripture talks about King David being the firstborn, where God makes him the firstborn over all kings of the earth. And it says this in Psalm 89, verse 27. It says, And I will make, so I, God, will make him, David, the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. And if you know anything about David's story, he is not the firstborn, born of Jesse. He's like the lastborn son in his family. He's also not the first king ever on earth. There was Saul before him and a bunch of other kings. God determined to give him a place of unique supremacy, sovereignty over all kings of the earth. And so when Paul uses this term, the firstborn of all creation, what Paul is telling us about Jesus is Jesus has this unique place of superiority, supremacy, and uniqueness over all things ever created. Meaning that there is nothing higher than our King Jesus. Supreme. How do we know this? How do I know that you're telling me the truth here, Eric? Because what Paul tells us next about this baby born on Christmas in verse 16. Who, what child is this? We're going to see that Christ, that Jesus, is the architect of creation, the builder of creation, and the owner of creation. Verse 16, it says, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. Paul first shows us that Jesus, this baby born in the manger, is the architect who designed everything in our world when it says that by him all things were created. This by him tells us that everything that we see or know about this world, from the bazillion of stars in the skies to the planets circling around the sun down to the smallest strand of DNA, was created, was designed by Christ. The power to create was in his being. It says, for by him all things were created. He's the architect. That from within, him designed every piece of what we see. If you had any question on what Paul means by this, he kind of gives an extensive list. He says all things created in heaven and on earth. And that's pretty easy to understand, right? And earth, heaven, right? And if you're trying to find a loophole, well, what about all the things that we can't see, like the spiritual realm and those things? Then Paul says, all things visible and invisible. Okay, we, we know the things visible, but what about the things invisible? What are you talking about? Then he tells them, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. This is the list of the created things in the spiritual realm that we cannot see. And we know from Scripture that there are angels and demons, that angels were created to serve God and serve his people. And then at some point there's a rebellion with a third of these angels, led by the lead angel, Lucifer, who wanted to be God, but was cast down to the earth, lost this rebellion, and now there's these realms. And now they rule the earth. Like it says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, it talks about these dominions and these rulers in authority in the spiritual realm. Like Ephesians chapter 6, it says, Verse 12, it says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, 
but against rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So Paul is telling us that even the angels and the demons and the dominions and the power were designed by Jesus. The Gnostics, who are beginning to infiltrate and creep into the church, taught that there were these various ranks in the spiritual realm and that Christ was one of these classes. That was the false teaching. And here, Paul is refuting the Gnostics. And he's refuting anybody else who speaks like the Gnostics, like the Jehovah Witnesses, or Mormons, or Muslims, who lessen Jesus to anything other than the source of all creation. We serve the source of all creation. Paul is telling us that this baby that was born on Christmas morning was the architect who designed everything. But then in wrapping up this section, Paul shows us that not only is he the architect, but he's also the contractor who has the power to build this creation that he thought up in his head when he says that all things were created through him. Notice it says that all things were created through him. This means that Jesus, this baby born in a manger, is the one who designed everything but also had the power to create every, everything seen and unseen. He's not only the architect, he's also the builder who has the power to take an idea and put it on paper or put it into reality. We see this in John chapter 1, verses 2 through 3. Or John says, he, this is Jesus, was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him, Jesus, was not anything made that was made. What child is this? It's the architect. It's the builder. And not only that, but Jesus is the owner. That's what we see. He's the one who was built for. And normally, a person would hire an architect and hire a contractor to design their house, to build their house, and then once it's built, they hand over the keys to the owner, right? But this is not the case. The final thing that we see in verse 16 is that all things were created for Jesus. All things were created through him and for him. If our world was designed and created through him and for him, that means everything that we see, everything that we know that exists, exists for his purpose, exists for his joy, exists to glorify Jesus. We, like the Colossians, we must believe that Jesus is God. Or our faith will become hollow our faith will become misdirected, and our faith will become meaningless. This is our central truth that we as Christians believe. Powerful. It's fun to sit in that. It's been fun preparing this message and just comprehending the fact that this all-powerful being would come to this earth for us, and we could see, physically see, him in human form, fully God, fully human. And we could see. And he come to us. So how are we to respond to this message today? By answering the question, what child is this that lay in the manger? Do you believe this? Do you actually believe this, that Jesus was the image of the invisible God? A God that loved you in such a way that he gave his son to pay your ransom, providing forgiveness in order to transfer you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light today. How do you answer this question? Have you answered this question? Who do you say that Christ is? Is this what you say? Do you believe this? How to respond to this message by answering the question, do I believe that everything was created for him? And by everything for him, that means me. Do I believe that I was created for him? 
alone for his purpose, for his joy. Not for your own purpose, but for his purpose. We, can, we get this messed up all the time. Even those Christians, many years, man, we have, even myself, all the time. Like, a lot of times I live to please myself and not God. If Jesus has made the world and everything that we know, and it was built for him, then for man to find their purpose is for man to find Jesus. The world will say, to find yourself, you have to look into yourself. Have you heard that before? No, what we're learning today, to find yourself, you must look only to the one who created you. Because you were created for him. And if we were created for him, then our purpose can only be found in Christ. There's nowhere else you need to go to be delivered. There's no other place you need to look to find forgiveness. There's no other place to find God. There's no other place to find answers. All you need is Jesus. I want to end today with a quote from C.S. Lewis in the book Mere Christianity. I have a hard time reading C.S. Lewis, but I want to encourage you on YouTube. There is a book, The Mere Christianity, and each chapter is illustrated, and it'll read it to you, and it illustrates each, everything that C.S. Lewis says. I want to give that to you. Go YouTube, C.S. Lewis, Mere Christianity, but here's a quote. Here's a quote. It says this, Look for yourself, and you will find in the long run only hatred, loneliness, despair, ruin, rage, and decay. But look for Christ, and you will find him. And with him, everything else thrown in. All creation. All meaning, all purpose is in Christ. All deliverance and forgiveness and redemption is in him alone. Who do you say that Jesus is? If you have never answered this question, answer it today. And it will transform your life. Say, Jesus, I didn't realize this, but I see it's clear that you are God. You said it by your own words. Paul says it, this, like this whole thing. And I see that this has the power to transform my life. I don't know exactly how it works. But Lord, I make you Lord. Jesus, I make you Lord. I see that my whole life is... Its meaning is for you. And I don't know what that means. And so I just encourage you, start reading Matthew or Mark or Luke or John, one of the Gospels, and, and start following this Jesus, just like the disciples did. Start following him. Read it for yourself. Because he is the way and the only truth and the only life. Jesus' words. So I just encourage you. So if, if, if you don't know Christ, if you've never made a decision to follow him, to place your faith in him, I just want to encourage you to do that today. And so I'm going to pray a prayer, and I just encourage you to pray it with me if you've never done that. And, uh, and then we're going to take communion. And um, this next thing that we're going to do, this communion that we're going to do, is for believers. You don't have to be a member here. You just have to place your faith in Jesus, the one who saved you, the one who forgave you, the one who transferred you. And it's a symbol of what he did on the cross to do that. The price paid to transfer you, to rescue you. And you can partake in this today by simply believing in him and the work that he's done. And answering this question, Jesus, I know that you are God. And that you saved me. And I ask that you forgive me of my sins. And may I serve you for the rest of my life. And so let me pray. Father, I thank you so much for your word. And God, the devil comes in and he causes us to question, does God's word really say that? Does God really say that? And we see that, man, it does. And we see that you are the architect, the builder, the owner. And God, we just ask, Lord, I pray for those in here today 
who have never answered this question or even answered it in a way that places you as Lord over their life, I just pray right now that they would believe you, that they would receive you, that they confess their sins with their mouth and confess you as Lord. And I thank you, Lord, that you have saved them and that you are rescuing them today. And I pray, Lord, that you would just do a work in their heart and move. And I pray for us today who um, kind of have made you, Lord, in a, in a small way over some things, Lord God. Help us to see that our fulfillment, our purpose is only in you, Lord God. Help us to make you Lord over every area of our life and our finances, with our kids, with our, our marriage or our relationships or at school, Lord, every area. May we just consult you because all things are worship and created by you. And we just thank you. We just pray, Lord God, that you would help us to put you number one on the throne this Advent season. And so, Lord, we just ask this. We thank you for the body and blood of Christ today, and we pray that you bless it to us. We confess our sins to you. In Jesus' name, amen.